Hi, I'm pharmacist Benjamin I. Fuchs, cosmetic chemist, nutritionist, and registered pharmacist. And this is the, this is the show where we talk about why your skin matters. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite ingredients. It's retinol, a form of vitamin A, which has become somewhat of a darling in the world of skincare. You see it advertised on uh, television now and over-the-counter products. Of course, uh, people in the know, in the skincare know, have been using retinol for many years. And as a pharmacist, we've studied retinol for a long time. In fact, retinol in its prescription form, retinoic acid, is well known among pharmacists and dermatologists as a very powerful go-to anti-aging ingredient, topical ingredient, as well as a uh, go-to anti-acne ingredient, which is kind of interesting. The same ingredient that works for preventing wrinkles, for reversing wrinkles, and photo damage also works for treating acne. So uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about uh, the nature of retinol as a vitamin. In my opinion, the single most important class of ingredients that anybody could ever use on their skin are the vitamins. Vitamins are molecules that interact with cells. They actually have a, an effect on cells. Remember, it's all about the cells, as we've talked about uh, previously. Uh, if you want to have effects on the skin via topical application of a product, you have to be able to address the cells, which are located, as we've said, underneath, underneath the surface, in the basal layer of the skin, so-called basal layer, which is the bottom of the epidermis and in the dermis itself, uh, where the fibroblasts live, the cells that make the collagen and the elastin and the hyaluronic acid. So you got to be at the level of the cell and you got to be able to interact with the cell with an ingredient when it's a topically applied ingredient, if you're going to make a difference in the skin. And without a doubt, the single most important class of ingredients that you can apply topically that will interact with cells are the vitamins. And that's really all vitamins, but most especially vitamin C, as we talked about in our last Skin Matters episode, and vitamin A. Now, vitamin A in its over-the-counter form, and its active over-the-counter form, is called retinol. But there's really different forms of vitamin A that you'll find in skincare products. The most common form of vitamin A, and probably the most ineffective form of vitamin A that's found in skincare products, is called retinyl palmitate. And retinyl palmitate will give you some effects, and I'll explain that how that works in a second, but uh, not a lot of effects. And you'll find retinyl palmitate in most over-the-counter uh, products that you get in department stores and in drug stores. Uh, although now that retinol is becoming kind of a darling, you're starting to see more of that. But for many years, retinyl palmitate has been the form of vitamin A that you'll, you would find in most over-the-counter skincare products. Not a really effective ingredient, although you do get some effects. The most powerful form of vitamin A, super powerful, is called retinoic acid. It has a brand name called tretinoin. And retinoic acid, i.e. tretinoin, in its brand name form, is uh, found, originally was found in a brand name prescription product called Retin-A. Now, when Retin-A first came out, it really revolutionized the skincare world. Uh, it was, it's only available by prescription, but it was really the first ingredient that could be applied topically to the skin that would make a significant difference in terms of number one, aging skin, number two, photo damaged skin, and as I said earlier, number three, acne prone skin. And then the over-the-counter version of retinoic acid, which requires a prescription, is called retinol. So the three main forms of vitamin A, retinyl palmitate, very mild, not really very strong, retinoic acid, super strong, but requires a prescription, and retinol, which is uh, kind of in between retinyl palmitate and retinoic acid. Technically, it's a precursor to retinoic acid. That is, that is it gets converted into retinoic acid are really the three main forms of vitamin A that you'll find in topical skincare products. So let's talk about each of these individually. Uh, first of all, it's important to recognize that all of these three ingredients, retinyl palmitate, retinol, and retinoic acid, work by virtue of uh, their conversion to the active form of vitamin A, retinoic acid. Obviously, retinoic acid doesn't need to be converted. It is the active form of vitamin A. So retinoic acid, the prescription form of vitamin A uh, in, t in terms of topical application, is the active form of vitamin A. The precursor to this active form, or pro-vitamin A, if you will, is retinol. And then retinyl palmitate is kind of like a storage form of vitamin A. So retinyl palmitate has to get converted into retinol, and then retinol has to get converted into retinoic acid. This is why retinoic acid is the most powerful form of vitamin A. It doesn't need to be converted. 
Retinol does need to be converted. And because of this conversion issue, retinol is about 100 times weaker than retinoic acid. You can, retinyl palmitate is probably 1,000 times weaker than retinoic acid. So it's kind of like sequential, retinyl palmitate, retinol, and retinoic acid. All three of these forms of vitamin A will have effects, but retinyl palmitate will be the mildest, retinol will be a little bit stronger, and then retinoic acid is the strongest. So what kind of effects can you expect from these three ingredients? Well, most importantly, growth. Ret, uh, vitamin A is a growth vitamin. I like to think of it as vitamin anabolic. Anabolic meaning to grow. Anabolism is to grow. So vitamin A is a growth substance. Taken internally, it's a growth substance too. It's very important for the, the development of bone. In fact, in order to understand the importance of vitamin A, you have to understand a concept called differentiation. Differentiation refers to how cells take shape. A cell is born, in the terms of the skin, a cell is born in the basal layer, and as it rises from the bottom to the top, it, become, it, it changes shape, it, it, it shape shifts. That shape shifting is referred to as differentiation, and you can think of it as the, sh the cell taking on different shapes. So as we've said this before, uh, your cells begin their life at the basal layer, the bottom layer of the skin, and they kind of rise up to the top, and then they come to rest at the top, and uh, at the very top, they're uh, basically a dead carcass of a cell. And as they're rising from the bottom to the top, there's all kinds of changes that are occurring in the cell. We talked about this on our first Skin Matters episode. And this, uh, this movement from the bottom to the top and the different shapes the cell is taking is called differentiation. It's very important that each step in the movement of uh, the cells from the bottom to the top in this differentiation process occurs correctly. It's very complicated. You know, we're being glib here. We're saying how the cell is taking on different shapes as it rising from the bottom to the top. But from a biochemical perspective, this is a very complex process. And this complexity requires correct biochemistry. And vitamin A assures that this differentiation process will occur uh, correctly. If it doesn't occur correctly, you can have defects at the surface, defective stratum corneum, a defective barrier. You can have um, incomplete, uh, incomplete shape shifting, resulting in less moisture factors, resulting in immune fact, uh, the, uh, the accumulation of immune factors and inflammation. So differentiation diseases are very common. The most uh, problematic and the most notorious differentiation disease is cancer. Cancer is um, an example of cells not taking on different shapes appropriately and rather than them taking on these different shapes appropriately, they get stuck in one shape. And the stickiness is what results in uh, the, uh, the rapid growth or rapid proliferation of skin cells and, or cells in general. And in fact, rapid proliferation of skin cells is also a uh, differentiation issue. Rapid proliferation of skin cells results in a condition called psoriasis. And psoriasis has a lot of similarities to cancer. So you would expect that vitamin A would be very important for treating cancer because it supports differentiation. And that happens to be the case. Vitamin A is actually used to treat lung cancer. Vitamin A topically can uh, be a preventative for skin cancer. And vitamin A is a tr topically is a treatment for pre-skin cancer, a condition called actinic keratosis, all because it supports this differentiation process. So number one, vitamin A is a growth vitamin. It supports differentiation. So it could be used topically for treating actinic keratosis. It could be used topically for treating psoriasis. It could be used to topically for treating eczema, and it could be used topically for treating acne, all of which are differentiation type illnesses. I didn't mention acne, but acne is also caused by differentiation issues, cells dividing rapidly inside of follicles because they're not, uh, they're not uh, uh, taking the appropriate steps in order to go from beginning to end of the process of gr uh, growth and development. Dif uh, in this way, acne is also a differentiation disease, and Retin-A or vitamin A is a go-to treatment for acne, both internally and topically. So number one, vitamin A is a differentiation supporting vitamin, taken internally as well as used topically. Number two, vitamin A supports growth. And in order to understand the importance or the, how vitamin A supports growth, we gotta recognize that vitamin A is a very unusual vitamin. In fact, vitamin A technically is a hormone. And what this means is not only does vitamin A support activity, it actually initiates activity. The word hormone in Greek is I arouse to activity. And hormones are much more fundamental than mere vitamins. And vitamin A is much more fundamental than ordinary vitamins in the sense that it actually initiates 
activity in a cell. So number one, it supports differentiation. Number two, it initiates activity inside a cell. And it doesn't just initiate activity at the level of the interior of a cell, it actually initiates activity in the genetics. Vitamin A turns on genes. This is so fascinating. In other words, you can apply vitamin A on top of the skin and you can create genetic changes inside the nucleus in the DNA of a skin cell. That's amazing for a topical ingredient. And this is one of the most important reasons why vitamin A is such a go-to active ingredient for topical skincare. It modifies the genetics. It, it's actually, we say, an epigenetic factor. And this, epigen this epigenetic nature allows it to, uh, to activate genes that are associated with the, uh, the secretion of, uh, of uh, moisture factors, the secretion of hyaluronic acid, and perhaps most importantly, the secretion of collagen and connective tissue fibers in the dermis. And this is why vitamin A is such an important go-to ingredient for anti-aging and for uh, not just pre uh, preventing photo damage, but actually for reversing photo damage. And this is all the forms of vitamin A, although sequentially, uh, retinyl palmitate is going to be the weakest form and retinoic acid is going to be the strongest form. So I'm hoping I'm making a case here for the importance of using retinol and retinoic acid and perhaps even retinyl palmitate topically on the skin. The reason I want to make a case for it is because there's a lot of people who have negative impressions about the importance of vitamin A or about the use of vitamin A topically on the skin. And the reason they have negative impressions is because, well, it turns out that this stimulating effect that retinoic acid and retinol have on the skin, not so much retinyl palmitate have on the skin, can sometimes be the cause of irritation. And so there are lay people, skincare professionals, and even medical professionals who will say to avoid or not use this very important ingredient. I totally disagree because of all the incredible benefits I've seen uh, from people who use retinoic acid and retinol. The reason uh, that uh, they're down on this ingredient is because of the irritation and, uh, and inflammation that this very important ingredient can sometimes cause. But here's the thing. If you have strong, healthy skin, especially a strong, healthy skin barrier as the surface of the skin, you should be able to use retinol and retinoic acid without a problem. However, a lot of people don't have a strong, healthy, a strong, healthy skin or a strong, healthy barrier. So those are the folks who will run into issues. If you have normal or strong, healthy skin, you should have no problem with retinol and retinoic acid. If you don't have strong, healthy skin and you want to use retinol and retinoic acid, there are some things you could do to strengthen the skin. Ironically, one of the things that you can do to strengthen the skin and the skin barrier is use retinol and retinoic acid. It's just kind of like a little catch-22. You need the retinol and retinoic acid to make your skin strong and healthy, but if your skin's not strong and healthy, you can't use the retinol and retinoic acid. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you can start off slowly. That is, you can take lots of time off between your applications of retinol and retinoic acid. Maybe use a retinol and retinoic acid containing product once a week, maybe even once every two weeks when you start. Your skin will acclimate to retinol and retinoic acid because you're strengthening the skin as you apply, as you apply the product, strengthening the skin and the skin barrier specifically. Another thing you could do is you can make sure that you are minimizing the uh, intake of immune stimulating foods. There's an important relationship between the digestive system and the skin. And people who have things like leaky gut issues, food intolerances, food allergies, will be much more prone towards irritation and inflammation from the use of retinol and retinoic acid. I say this because it's really important not to blame the ingredient when you have an immune problem or an inflammatory issue or a weakened skin barrier issue uh, that precludes or prevents your, the use of retinol or retinoic acid or creates issues when you use the product. Don't blame the, uh, the vitamin. Don't blame the ingredient. Blame your immune system. Blame your digestive system. Or blame a weakened skin barrier. So working on strengthening the skin barrier by, by starting off slowly with retinol and retinoic acid is one strategy. You can also use alpha hydroxy acids to strengthen your skin barrier. And then making sure you're avoiding problem foods, working on leaky gut issues. We'll talk about the digestive system and its relationship to skin health on another Skin Matters program. But for now, just understand that there's a very important connection between leaky gut issues, that is things leaking into the bloodstream through the digestive system, food intolerances and food allergies, 
and the likelihood that you're going to have problems with using this very important ingredient or these very important ingredients, retinol and retinoic acid. Retinol palmitate, you're probably not going to have uh, any significant issues because, as I said, it's just so darn mild. Another thing you can do to strengthen your skin barrier is you, and strengthen skin is use nutrition. Essential fatty acids are very helpful for the skin. Also, um, uh, phospholipids. Phospholipids are ingredients that are found in eggs and grains and legumes. Uh, phospholipids are also very important for strengthening the skin barrier. And if you have digestive issues, using things like probiotics, digestive enzymes with your meals, uh, apple cider vinegar with your meals, bile and, and uh, bile salts or lecithin granules can also be helpful for helping the body process nutrients at the level of the digestive system, strengthening the intestines so you can prevent foods and particles, food particles from leaking into the blood if you have leaky gut issues, things like gelatin or collagen or collagen peptides or essential fatty acids, those can have uh, all be protective, uh, have intestinal protective effects. Fucoidin, which is a... Uh, a, a polysaccharide, a sugar-like material that's found in seaweed can also have a coating effect on the intestine. Aloe vera can also have a coating effect on the intestine. These are all valuable nutritional supplements and, and dietary supplements that you can use for the prevention of leaky gut. Uh, and I'll talk about this on uh, another Skin Matters episode, but for now, I really want to emphasize this. One of the worst things you can ingest if you have leaky gut issues, one of the most pro-intestinal inflammatory substances that you could ever put in your system, put in your body, is fried and processed fats. French fries and pizza and potato chips. And you know we, we have this uh, obsession with fried foods and deep fried foods especially, distorted fried fats are very pro-inflammatory for the intestine. And I would suspect that this is the leading cause of leaky gut issue. Uh, leaky, leaky gut issues is the ingestion of these kinds of fats. Also, uh, gluten can be pro-inflammatory. Most people know about gluten these days, but there's other components that are found in cereal grains and seeds and nuts uh, and legumes that uh, can irritate or exacerbate a leaky gut issue. Uh, it's not just gluten, so you're not out of the woods just by going gluten-free. You gotta make sure that you're, uh, you're doing things like a, a food diary where you're seeing what kind of foods cause problems specifically. As I said, we'll talk about this on another Skin Matters episode. So working on the gut, working to strengthen the skin barrier with internal nutrition, working to strengthen the skin barrier by using retinol, using alpha hydroxy acids, these can all help mitigate or reduce the likelihood of inflammatory problems with, uh, with the topical application of retinol. You kind of th I kind of think of using retinol and retinoic acid like going to the gym. When you go to the gym, if you're weak, you're not going to go lift 300 pounds. You're going to start off by lifting 50 pounds, 100 pounds. And as you get stronger, you'll increase the amount of weight that you can lift. Same thing with retinol and retinoic acid. Start off slow. Start off with a low dose. And then your skin barrier will get stronger. Your skin will get healthier. And then you can kind of gradually up your dose. As I said, maybe start off once a week, twice a week once every two weeks, and then gradually go into every couple of days. Start off with a low concentration of retinol and retinoic acid. And actually, we should probably talk about the dosage or the concentrations of retinol and retinoic acid. Retinoic acid, the prescription strength comes in 0.01% strength, 0.025% strength, and then 0.05, and then 0.1% strength. In my compounding pharmacy, sometimes I'll make a 0.2% retinoic acid. If you're starting a retinoic acid program, if you're um, using the prescription strength, you want to start off low. Start off with 0.01% and gradually work your way up. Start off with maybe once every couple of weeks and then work your way into once a week and then every couple of days and kind of just gradually let your skin get used to higher and higher concentrations and greater and greater frequency of application. Retinol, if you don't want to go to uh, deal with the whole prescription thing and go to a dermatologist and wait in line at the pharmacy, retinol can give you exactly the same benefits as retinoic acid, albeit with not as much intensity. Remember, retinol is about 100 times weaker than retinoic acid. So a 0.01% retinoic acid would be like a 1% retinol. It's a 100 times factor. 0 0.01 times 100 is 1. 0.05% retinoic acid is, uh, would be equivalent to 5% retinol. 
I personally like higher doses of, retino, of retinol because I like my patients to really feel an effect. So I recommend starting off with 1% retinol, start off maybe once a week or once every couple of weeks, gradually increase your frequency. And then over time, you can go up to a 2.5% retinol or 5% retinol. You're not gonna find these products, these uh, kinds of concentrations in a lot of products. In fact, it's very rare. I've been formulating with very high concentrations of retinol for many, many years, and I get really great results with it. Also, if you combine, this is going to shock some folks, if you combine your retinol with vitamin C, you'll get some really interesting effects. Number one, the retinol will increase the penetration of your vitamin C, and the vitamin C will take some of the bite out of your retinol. Vitamin C is very soothing and very anti-inflammatory, and it's an antioxidant. So you say, wait a minute. Isn't retinol going to destabilize vitamin C and you shouldn't use them together? And this is kind of a meme, uh, a myth, a misunderstanding that's out there in the world of skincare that you shouldn't mix these two ingredients. Well, guess what? That's true about water-soluble vitamin C. That's true about, um, about ascorbic acid. If you are using ascorbic acid with retinol, you'll find that ascorbic acid can increase the irritation of retinol and retinol can destabilize or break down ascorbic acid. However, that's not true about fat-soluble vitamin C. Remember on our last Skin Matters episode, we made that very important distinction between fat-soluble vitamin C, i.e. THDA, or also ascorbyl palmitate, THDA is tetrahexyl decal ascorbate, or ascorbyl palmitate, uh, we made a very important distinction between those fatty forms and ascorbic acid. Uh, what's true about the destabilization and the increased irritation when you combine ascorbic acid with retinol is not true about fat-soluble vitamin C. Fat-soluble vitamin C is stable to retinol, number one, and not only does it not increase irritation, it also uh, it decreases the bite of retinol. That's the same, the same is true about retinoic acid. And these two ingredients, uh, when combined, uh, as retinol or retinoic acid and fat soluble vitamin C are perfect together, ideal together, and I always formulate with them, uh, with them together. A couple other things, and we'll wind this down, and then we can talk a little bit more uh, about retinol because there's a lot to say about retinol and retinoic acid on our next Skin Matters episode. Retinol and retinoic acid are great skin lighteners. Skin lightening is a very tricky procedure, topically, because when you're lightening the skin, you got to be a little bit aggressive. And so hydroquinone, which is the go-to uh, skin lightening uh, ingredient that you'll get in prescription products and even over-the-counter products, uh, alpha hydroxy acids sometimes, they can, be a little bit, they can be a little bit harsh on the skin. Retinol, while it can be sometimes inflammatory, as we talked about, not only gives you skin lightening benefits, but it also gives you anti-aging benefits and anti-blemish benefits and anti-skin cancer benefits. A second thing that's important to recognize about retinol and retinoic acid is not only do they have effects uh, anti-photo damage effects and anti-skin cancer effects and anti-acne effects, they all, they're also important for skin lipids. So uh, retinol and retinoic acid are actually, ironically, moisturizing. They will actually increase the production of skin fats. So they're ideal for treating uh, dry skin in the long run. In the short run, because of their ability to exfoliate, you may get a little bit of dryness, but retinol and retinoic acid are actually stimulating and they're actually supportive of skin fats. In fact, when you deprive the body of retinol and retinoic acid, as if you were taking Accutane, which has a um, decreasing effect or a, uh, has a uh, antagonistic effect on vitamin A, one of the major side effects is skin dryness. In fact, uh, not just skin dryness, but the dryness of mucous membranes, throat dryness, tear, uh, dry eyes, even uh, it, it can even impair secretions at the level of the digestive system. We'll talk about that uh, on our next Skin Matters episode. Okay, so in the interest of winding down this, uh, this Skin Matters episode, we'll talk more on our next Skin Matters episode about some other, uh, some other important aspects of retinol and retinoic acid applied topically. Uh, we'll just uh, wind this down. Retinoic acid and retinol are differentiation supporting. They're anabolic. They protect skin fats. You got to be a little bit careful if you have uh, impaired barrier or if you have digestive health issues, leaky gut, uh, leaky gut, et cetera. So uh, correct gut issues using nutritional supplements, using food elimination. Um, you strengthen the skin barrier by using phospholipids and essential fatty acids. Uh, and also you can... Uh, uh, 
you can get the benefits of retinol and retinoic acid and, and reduce the inflammation and irritation by starting off slowly, starting off with a low dose, working yourself, a low concentration, working yourself into a higher concentration, and then starting off with lower frequency and working yourself into more frequency. Bottom line is, this is an incredible, powerful, anti-aging skin health ingredient, but it has to be used intelligently, it has to be used strategically, and it has to be used with awareness and consciousness. Like a lot of skincare ingredients, just because uh, you can, some people have problems with it doesn't mean you wanna throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Just figure out how to use it intelligently. All right, that's it for today's Skin Matters episode. We'll talk more about retinol in our next episode, and we'll also, in coming episodes, talk about skin lightening and also talk about the gut-skin axis, the relationship between digestive health and the skin. I'm pharmacist Benjamin I. Fuchs, and this is Your Skin Matters.